and welcome to episode 17 of Attention Engineer. I'm Laura Kidd, a Bristol-based music producer, songwriter and independent solo artist making music as pen friend. In this noisy world, the gift of someone's attention is priceless. So thank you for joining me on my mission to inspire creativity in every listener through having the honest conversations I've always hoped for with some of the artists I admire the most. It's lovely to be back after my short break. After four months of publishing podcast episodes, it felt really lazy to stop for a while, but I had a self-imposed deadline to complete all the recording for the debut Penfriend album. Now, I hadn't factored in any time for a stress burnout and then a running accident during my podcasting break, but both of those things did happen. I wrote a piece about the burnout on my blog once I was feeling a bit better, just because I think if I'm sharing good things online, it would be disingenuous to pretend that no bad things ever happened. I also recently read a book called Essentialism by Greg McKeown, and I wrote up some of the takeaways in the post as well, because I know I'm not alone in finding things hard sometimes. Understatement of the year alert! I'm feeling a lot better now, down to proper sleep, healthy food, lots of exercise, keeping up with writing my morning pages, and making really great progress with the album. I've set myself a revised deadline of this Sunday to complete everything, now that I can actually use my hands and face again after my accident. I thought exercise was supposed to be good for you. Anyway, it's been a challenging year for all of us, and I hope you're getting through these strange times in one piece. I know a quick glance at the news can put pay to any good mood, so I promise to do my part to bring you useful and nourishing things to help balance the shitstorm in whatever way I can. I'm really looking forward to sharing some more really interesting, honest and inspiring conversations with you in the coming weeks. I've learned so much and been so creatively G'd up by all of the chats so far, and it's been wonderful to read your emails and reviews telling me that you feel the same. Hooray! So, shall we? Corinne Tucker is a singer, songwriter and guitarist, best known for her work with rock band Slater Kinney. She started her career playing an influential early 90s riot girl band Heavens to Betsy. She's released solo music as the Corinne Tucker Band and collaborates with R.E.M.'s Peter Buck in Filthy Friends. I had the tremendous good fortune to support Filthy Friends in London in 2019 and was very nervous to meet the band, but they couldn't have been nicer or more supportive. They all made sure to say hello, they all watched me play, and we all went down the road for a drink afterwards. It was a total dream gig. My angle for Attention Engineer is to have the conversations I always hope for but don't usually get to have because of the logistics of playing shows. Contrary to how it might seem, musicians aren't usually hanging out in luxurious backstage areas making the best of friends, but actually, that night, despite the usual pokey dressing room and having to load a lot of gear in and out of vehicle scenario, it was a really friendly experience. Massive thanks to Corin, Peter, Scott and Linda and their very welcoming fans for making it such a lovely evening. I was really delighted and honoured that Corin agreed to have a follow-up conversation with me and record it this time. So, here we go. Yeah, things here are fine. Um, it's not actually locked down anymore though they're talking about how it might be again soon but I've just been all the way locked down since March pretty much I haven't seen many people so I'm going mm-hmm. a bit going a bit bonkers now to be honest how about you how's it over there it's been pretty intense I have to say like because not only because of the pandemic you know we we've been on pretty strict lockdown in Oregon because of that <clears throat> but the civil unrest in Portland has been um, super intense. So it's, um, yeah, just, it's a lot of emotions, a lot of stress, a lot of, um, altercations. Uh, yeah, Mm. it's been hard for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's just, it feels really good today that it's actually raining and our city feels, that feels so like healthy and normal for our city. So it would be like lovely to have like breathable air again. And, you know, like, cause that's yeah. kind of, it's, it's kind of what's been keeping us going through the pandemic is being able to at least go on a walk outside. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and you haven't been able to do that, you can't leave your house um, when the air is like unbreathable. So it's been hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that does sound intense. Are you, are you homeschooling as well at the moment? Yeah. Um, my daughter is 12. And so she's in seventh grade. And um, she is homeschooling. That is going well. I'm super thankful for that, actually. Um, you know, our teachers are, are all teaching from their homes for the most part, too, when they have kids. I mean, I know a lot of her teachers are, are parents themselves. So they're at their own kitchen table trying to teach a class of 30 kids with their own kids run. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of heroes around this year. Exactly. (laughs) It's a lot of people. I mean, teachers, firefighters, like those are our heroes right now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For anyone listening who's not sure who I'm talking to, (laughs) would you be up for introducing yourself? (laughs) Yeah. Sorry. Um, (laughs) This is Corinne Tucker, and I'm a musician um, in bands like Slater Kinney and Filthy Friends. And it is Slater Kinney, isn't it? Because I've basically been saying it wrong. I've been saying it wrong up until the day I talked to Katie Harkin for this podcast. And then I was like, no, how have I, how have I managed that? As long as you say the name and we love all pronunciations. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you, but I still yeah. feel very silly about that. Oh, no, actually, I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I first came across Slater Kinney in 2005 when I first started my old band. And I only heard about you because someone I knew said the band sounded like Slater Kinney. And I was like, I'm sure that's a compliment. That's really nice. Who is this band? And then I looked you up and I was like, well, I'll take the compliment. I don't think it's true or anything, but what an amazing band. And so from then on, I was in, you know. And then, of course, you decided to to quit the following year. Thanks for that. (laughs) But then this wonderful comeback has happened. Right. So how's that all been going? It's a big question, a small (laughs) question for a big thing, of course. It's been really good. I mean, I think that something, you know, one thing about being a musician and and having a band that's been around for like 20, um, 24 years or something crazy, um, is that you have Mm. a lot of different versions of the band, you know, um, you have a lot of different eras of the band, um, Mm. And I love that. I love, and I, and for me as a musician, it's allowed me to, um, you know, grow as a songwriter from starting out in the beginning of, um, you know, just coming from like a super indie punk rock scene and, um, you know, trying like a lot of different things with the band, like different albums and, you know, we played with different people over the years. I'm super grateful to play, have played with like Katie Harkin and Toko Yasuda and Angie Boylan on the last tour we did. It was so fun. And, you know, I just have really uh, been grateful to have the kind of like long, interesting career that we've had. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see that. And I love the newest album. I think it's brilliant I was so I was beside myself with joy when I heard that you were going to be working with St Vincent on it and because I've loved her for a very long time as well I saw her play solo in London in 2007 before anyone had heard of her and I I felt very cool to know to know of her back then and the result is just spectacular I'm delighted with that I hope you are as well (laughs) absolutely I mean she's she's amazing and it was like you know such a cool journey to work with her and um you know to just try so many different things in the studio and you know to get to have her creative brain to 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 work with was super fun yeah I was really interested to ask about collaboration because you you've been a key member of several brilliant bands including Slate Kinney of course but also Heavens to Betsy, Filthy Friends and your own solo project so is that by accident or by design? Oh it's definitely by design um Hmm. I definitely feel like I'm at my best when I'm collaborating. Um, I'm not at all a trained musician. <laughs> I don't have that, um, that skill set or that vocabulary. Um, I have a really good ear and I have, um, strong opinions about music and strong sense of taste. Mm. And, um, and I'm a good writer. 
but I'm not the kind of person that can play a bunch of different instruments. And one thing that I think is good to learn about yourself is what your strengths are and, and what your weaknesses are or where, where you sort of need assistance with, you know, Mm -hmm. doing creative work. Um, and so I've also found that, you know, I have more fun when I'm with a bunch of people. That's just, it pushes me harder. It sparks me. I sort of need that, um, inspiration and that edge, I guess, mm. to, to, cause when you're in a room with people, sometimes there is a little bit of like, I don't know if it's healthy competition or if it's, you know, like people are, are trying to like, you know, do their best when you're with, when you're around other people. And I think definitely for me, that works where I'm like, okay, you know, this person's doing this. What if I do this? You know? And, and I think that has brought out like, um, my strengths as like a writer and a singer and a musician. So do you find people who you then intentionally put together because you want to do a certain kind of music and you think it will work with them? Yeah. I mean, I think some of it is like, well, who do you, who do you like? Who do you get along with? I think that's huge, you know? Yeah. yeah who do you want to be in a van with? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, like I think that, um, well, for instance, working with Peter Bach and Filthy Friends is, you know, he's someone that I've admired, you know, for years and years, loved REM and was a huge fan. And then I think I sang on his solo album um, that, you know, Scott McCoy invited me down and I sang a song on that. And it just, we just hit it off, Mm. you know, Peter and Scott and I, and um, I think, you know, we just kind of got along and, and realized like, you know, that we could, that maybe it'd be interesting to do more together. And, and Peter called me, you know, maybe a few weeks later and was like, Hey, what if we, you know, write some more music together? And that's so cool. It was super cool. It was super cool. And, um, did you pinch yourself that day or do a little dance or something? I did do a little dance. Oh, good. That <laughs> I makes did do a little good. dance. Yeah. <laughs> you have to <laughs> celebrate like, these things, right? I, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's something that that is such a huge thing about doing music is that it's not just um it's not just about like you know accomplishment and and creative work it's also mm. about friendship and it's about community and it's yeah. about that human connection and kind of looking at the world together yeah. you know and i think that's just a huge gift about collaboration mm. um one thing that i i wanted to mention that i've gotten to do recently um in the past few months is i worked with um sharon cheslow and Julia Holter, and we um, did this song uh, collaboration totally uh, via like file share mm. um, that's called For the Light. And we just released it on Bandcamp. Yay. I haven't yeah. heard it yet. That's exciting. I'll send you the link. It's it's super cool. And it's just, it's been like such a an absolute like joy to to collaborate with with different people and to, you know, through like the past very difficult six last six months, it's like, Oh, this, this new thing is like working with, you know, friends that I've admired for a long time. Like Sharon Cheslow is like an incredible guitarist and musician. Mm. So, so I think that aspect of collaboration is also, um, you know, it's about community. I think it's really, really rewarding. Yeah. It makes me so happy when I meet people who I admire who are just really, really nice. Peter yeah. Buck, you're one of them, of course, but I was a bit more frightened to meet you when I played with you last year. <laughs> I remember walking up and going, just play it cool because don't be too much at this woman because she's getting ready to do her show. So just like, say hi. Don't be like, because sometimes I, I'm too scared to say hello and I think that comes off really bad, you know, but it would be from fear, not from, you know, not wanting to say hello. So I was really like, oh, just... 
oh, this is normal. Normal. Peter Buck's there. Corin Tucker's there. No big deal. <laughs> it, was really, it was a big deal. I did a very big dance before and after that show. But it, uh, I did find it to be so lovely that your whole band were just so welcoming and sweet and and wanted to watch the, the support band and stuff. And that, that says a lot about people to me anyway as yeah. a support band obviously so yeah. yeah well I thought you were great and I and I I think Thank that's you. um you know one of the joys of playing music and touring is meeting new people yeah and meeting new like artists that you're like oh she's super amazing and also I thought you were so funny on stage <laughs> really? I was like she's really good like she could also do comedy <laughs> Like that's, I, I, I don't you. have that skill live at all. And I, I really admired it. So it was a bit of yeah. a blur to be honest, because I could see you and I could see Peter and I was just like, <laughs> oh God, let's get through it. <laughs> I did enjoy it though. It was lovely. It was okay. a lovely show. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things that's really important to keep you going through touring because it is sure. difficult. Yeah. And it, there are times where we're like, I just want to jump out of this van right now. Is, <laughs> is that like... When you get the chance to meet someone new and see their music and, mm -hmm. and do it, you just like take that opportunity. Yeah. You know? Of course. Like, yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. I definitely do. Yeah. And I was very aware that I was playing my St. Vincent guitar, which I play all the time. And I was like, nice. I'm playing this in a room with someone who has been in a room with her. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> it's really cool. I That's enjoyed that amazing. part of it very much. It was really good. And yeah, the, the buzz of that whole show kept me going on my three hour drive home. It was really good. <laughs> good. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Is there one musical project you think of as your primary vehicle when you're thinking about songwriting? Um, like, do you write specifically for mm. a project? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think Slater Kinney is huge in terms of mm -hmm. my like, um, songwriting energy is, you know, it's, it's been, it's been my primary band and we've been fortunate enough to be successful in terms of like having a career, mm -hmm. you know? So I think I, I do think about songwriting for that band, um, kind of first and foremost, and also because of the way that Slater Kinney writes, it's all usually in a super weird keys because we detune our guitars to C sharp. Mm -hmm. So it has to be very, um, you know, you have to be uh, really specific about writing for, for that band. I can't just pick up a regular standard guitar yeah, tuned in E and start writing. Like that's just, that's just going to be super complicated. <laughs> Not going to work. Course. So you're just like, right, we're detuning today. It's like a Kinney day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. even when I'm writing on the computer, Mm -hmm. and writing um like on a keyboard you, I have to pay attention like okay what key am I in like I can't I can't just be writing in in you know a standard key for that for that band so yeah, yeah there is there is a lot of intention that I think has to go into it yeah and how much of your time is spent writing music at the moment? I mean, at the moment, it's such a weird thing to say because everything's right. so weird at the moment. Yeah. In general, how much of your time do you spend writing? I think that I, um, I really write for a project. Like, I'm not the kind of person that's like, I need to write music every day. Um, I do a lot better when it's, when it's like there is a, a purpose and an idea, you know? Yeah. But um, I've actually have been writing Slater Kinney stuff, you know, during the pandemic. Um, it's been, you know, just kind of a sanity saver. I mean, it's it's been yeah. like super, super important to feel like um, there's like music still happening in our lives, you know? Yeah. So I have been writing. And when I do that, I usually have like, about two hours in me a day of for writing music and trying mm. different things um, where I feel like I am in the zone and can come up with something maybe that would be decent or I can't, I'm not one of those people that can write all day long. I just yeah. don't have that kind of brain. I don't know if they um, exist really. I think it's easy to assume that, that people are just sort of turning up and knocking out like eight hour days of brilliant songwriting, but they're probably not. They just won't no. say they're not. <laughs> right. <laughs> they right. just like, probably don't say at all. It's really right. interesting to hear you say that. Because you probably we don't have limitless energy for anything. Like we have a certain amount of energy per day, probably. 
mm-hmm. for particular things and it's very intense focus as well it's hard mm-hmm. to have that for a prolonged period of time I think I think so too two hours is good yeah and I also think that um it's really important to allow yourself to mess around try a bunch of different things know that yeah. what you're coming up with there might not be anything decent in there when you come because I come back to it the next day I'm like oof no, you know, <laughs> and at the time I'm like, oh, this could be cool. And then you have to like have come back with fresh ears yeah. and then, you know, kind of reassess. Yeah. But I heard something really inspiring once that Dolly Parton said that she said, you know, I write about five songs a day. And if I'm lucky, one of them is good. is yeah. dec- halfway decent. Yeah. And that was like super inspiring to me to know that like one of, I think the world's best songwriters, you know, Definitely. She writes a lot and, and, you know, and can recognize that, you know, only 20% of it is at all, you know, listenable to other humans. So that's, that's just a good thing to know about work ethic and, and writing Yeah, is that it, it takes a lot more time than you might realize. Yeah. And I think if you can sort of, what's the word I want to use? Kind of, if you can defetishize writing or songwriting or making music at all, and make it into more of a kind of a mundane, but not an unmagical thing, but a thing of like, I'm gonna just try, and and if it's not the best thing in the world, it doesn't mean I suck and I shouldn't do this again. It just means that that is what the process is. Yeah. So I was listening to something recently, which is about writer's block, which I think is kind of made up bullshit excuses that people use not to do work really, but. I, I so I don't really subscribe to that idea, but but th- this guy was talking about how writer's block is just the state of writing, and he's talking mm-hmm. about writing prose or writing songs or anything. I think it, it's not easy and fun, and all these lyrics don't zing off your tongue, and they're amazing. It is it's work, and it's I find like the most magical and fun work ever. But it, it's hard, and you doubt yourself all the time, and a lot of the time I spend a lot of time thinking well that's the worst thing in the world that's not even a real song then I have to listen to a, someone else's music to to find out what a real song sounds like which is mm-hmm. so silly so it's like a lot of holding your nerve I feel like as well absolutely yeah and I think it's um I think it's it's a lot about addressing that critic in your head mm. that's telling you those things that's the worst thing yeah. in the world and and mm. you know it's not a real song all of those things, um, that to me is writer's block, is that mm-hmm. that idea in your head that um, you have to be able to just come up with something amazing your first try or or even like during the week. It's like, you know, it's, I just don't think that's how writing works. I think it is a lot of um, like muscle, mm-hmm. like So, and I mean, like the writing muscles, um, are sharpened the more you do it and the Mm -hmm. more, um, material you come up with, I think, um, the better you get at it. And so oftentimes you'll just be writing 10 or 15 songs and you're just warming up, you know, you're just getting, um, those muscles like built up so that when like real inspiration strikes, you're ready. Mm -hmm. And like, and that emotion is, is you need, you need to express something. You have those skills built up and it just, you can really hit the song because you need to, but you need those, you need that, those skills and those muscles so that, um, you know what to do with that inspiration when it comes. Yeah. That makes sense. That's a lovely idea. Yeah. And I think editing is such a massive skill of in everything, really. It's like, you know, when someone puts 52 terrible pictures up on the internet, they could have just picked one. Yeah. Or if, you know, you just put these things, oh, I've got 10 songs that are finished. That's an album. Well, it doesn't have to be. It could just be that you need to write a few more, spend mm-hmm. a bit more time on it, craft it a bit more, you know. Yeah. Especially when, like, as you know, you've, you've been releasing albums for a long time, when you have to stand behind those songs and do press about those songs for quite a substantial time afterwards. I think putting that time in and making sure you absolutely love and stand behind those songs is so important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that um, that is one of the things I love about collaborating is that that editing process and that um, ability to work on the, the craft and like, how can we make this song absolutely the best? is like, Mm. um, it's something that I think is super important 
um, you know, in, in terms of, of writing music and, um, you know, thinking that it's, how can it make its strongest impact on an audience? Mm. So, and I, I actually love that part of it. I really like editing things and cause it's like, you're kind of engineering it mm. right to be its absolute best. Yeah. So I think it's crucial. It's a crucial part of the, the process. Yeah. I've done a bit of collaboration, but not for a long time. Cause what I, what I do with my solo project is quite different than a collaboration would be. But partly I think it's because I find the idea of collaboration really, really scary because being able to come up with something I think is good enough to sort of show other people, but being able to kind of let it go enough so that they could critique it or change it without me is sort of devastating me. I can imagine that would put a lot of people off trying to write with others. So finding the right people must be very important in that sense. Absolutely. And I think that, um, I think that's something that is, was a lot harder for me when I was younger. Yeah. Sorry. I'm dying of thirst. That's okay. And I think that I used to get my feelings hurt a lot Mm. when, uh, you know, you get feedback from people you're working with and they'd be like, "Uh, I don't think this song really works or, you know, Mm. this lyrics kind of cheesy or, you know, um, I think we need to work on this. You know, I think that, um, I was so young when I started out, you know, I was like 20 when we started the band Slater Kinney started like 21, 22. I mean, really young and not mature enough to really, um, you know, have a kind of detachment Mm. that I think you need in collaboration so that it's really about the work and then it's not your ego isn't always front and center with that song. And, um, and now that I'm older, I really, um, have an easier time with that because I've, I've, you know, thought about this idea of detachment and, um, having it more be about the work and not about like, my ego or my skills or my worth as a person. Yeah. You know, so it took, that's a process and it's a learned skill. I think, um, it's something that, uh, I've gotten better at like over the years in terms of collaboration. Yeah. I'm sure that takes practice as well. Cause when someone says the lyric is cheesy, they're not saying Corinne, you are cheesy. You personally are a bad person, <laughs> or anything like that. Right. It's just literally, the the, the lyric is cheesy. Or they exactly. Think it's, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, okay, well, how do we, how do we make this better? How do we say it a different way? You know. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it does take practice not to not to take it personally. Yeah, I need to start practicing that. I am I am working on a collaboration with someone um, actually, which is good, and we haven't got to the point where it's like you know, being critically assessed by each other yet, which is good. So it's just kind of throwing a load of ideas down. I can do that. That's fine. <laughs> it's just a bit where I'm like, okay, now I have to put my big girl pants on and understand this is not about my worth as a person, like you say. I think um, that'll be interesting. But yeah, it's good. I think it'll help me grow. I'm always trying to grow. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, that's, I think it's so important. I think it's so, yeah. I think being an artist is is all about like trying to grow and, you know, have that be a part of your music too. Yeah, for sure. Having written so many songs, do you ever worry about running out of things to say? Um, I mean, yeah, there, there's definitely been times where I worry about like shredding on the same material or, you know, mm. um, that like maybe my perspective has people have already heard from that idea, mm-hmm. but I think that for me, songwriting and creativity is like, it's a way of, you know, helping me understand the world and, and thinking about like where we're at and, um, it's the past, you know, five years have not been like boring in any way. No. You know, there's just been a lot of um, turmoil. 
So there's, mm-hmm. there's, I don't, I don't think I've run out of, of things to say, you know? Yeah. The world is still doomed and there's plenty of different aspects to that to write about. I feel. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it will, it's, we have a lot of work to do. Let's put yeah. it that way. That's a much more positive <laughs> slant. Yeah. I try not to say that we're all doomed thing too much. Yeah. But I've been thinking about my own, the record I'm, a, I'm finishing off at the moment. I started writing it at the beginning of 2019 and it was all about, stuff to do with depression personally and stuff to do with um, the effect that Brexit was having on the country and the sort of different feelings about that that I had personally and again trying to think of it more in in terms of a more general um, approach as well not just myself and then all this stuff happened this year so it's just like I need to finish it soon because I can't take another sort of catastrophic world event coming along to elbow its way in it just needs to be about these particular things and then move on. But I, I, I really personally love hearing from artists at different stages of their life as well. And like you were saying about Slater Kinney having had all these different eras, that's I find that fascinating because personally as a listener, I start trusting the people who are writing the songs, you know, and really trying to see what they say about things next. So for me, the sense of Warrant Hold was really interesting because I wanted to hear Slater Kinney's perspective on all this stuff that was going on. And I'll want to hear your perspective on the next bunch of stuff as well. So I, I kind of attach myself to different artists in that way and want to hear what, what yeah, what their take is, is on the, the current situation. So I'm so glad that you're still doing that, basically. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, I feel like the same attachment to different artists, you know, like Nick Cave, someone who's written over the years about so many different things or, you know, I feel like it really is a community of artists and writers Because we need each other to process what's going on. We absolutely need that soul searching, you know, to, Mm. to, you know, kind of take stock from each other. Like, well, how do we handle this? Yeah. You know, what is the best way forward or, or, you know, how do we make sense of these things? Um, You know, there is like an artistic voice that helps us process you know, these kind of like huge world events Mm. that we're living through. Yeah, because the only way I feel like the only way to deal with it is to break it down into much smaller chunks because it's just too big. You can't, I mean, everything's so overwhelming. Even in your own personal life, everything can be so overwhelming, it's impossible to deal with. So like breaking it all down into little bits to try and be like, well, okay, so what does Corin write about this subject? What does this person write about it? And what do I feel? And that that sort of the way that people can sum up what you were thinking or feeling in a lyric so mm-hmm. beautifully that you could never have done. I mean, even as a songwriter, I mean, and of course for listeners to music who don't also write their own songs, it's that thing of, oh, my favourite art- artist said it so perfectly, that thing I couldn't crystallise myself. That's such a powerful thing. It's huge. It's mm. huge. And it helps us process our own feelings. You know, it helps us, Yeah. it gives us catharsis. You know, when someone else we we love is able to sing this thing and we're singing along with it, it's like we can acknowledge those feelings and they don't, it, you know, we're not so overwhelmed or strangled by the, those emotions and, and this mm. feeling of helplessness that we might have sometimes, you know, it, yeah. it gives us a sense of, of clarity on things. Yeah. And I used to be really conscious that I was doing that. If, if ever if ever I had a breakup, I would always be going to listen to certain <laughs> songs to be like, tell me everything's going to, well, not really tell me everything's going to be okay, but just tell me how shitty the person is so I can feel like a victim or whatever. It was much more that kind of perspective I had, which is mm-hmm. rather childish. But But these days I really am looking to people to tell me how to deal with, you know, global warming, Donald Trump. Boris Johnson and all of this other stuff, which is like, yeah, it's a lot of responsibility to put on a musician, but you know, where else am I going to look? So it's, right. it's, it does help me definitely. And to write about it as well, of course. And I, I hope that can help some others in some weird way when my record's done, but we'll see. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, I think that's, that's just a huge service. That is like the service of music yeah. and art in general, you know, is, is to look at well, what's, what, how is the human, um, the human experience of these giant, like life-changing things mm. and love and, and, you know, relationships are part of that too, mm-hmm. which is why I think we, we crave art and music to, to under, understand other people's experiences and, and to look and to see if they mirror our own experience of those things. Yeah. 
Over to you now for a new segment I'm calling Correspondence Corner. The Correspondence Club is what drives the Penfriend project and everyone is welcome to join. Just head to my website penfriend.rocks and I'll send you two free songs immediately. In this part of the podcast, I pass the mic to the correspondents. I'm always fascinated in other people's experiences of coming across a piece of music that really speaks to them. Music fans come from all walks of life and the people in the audience are just as interesting as those on stage. So, I asked, what was the first piece of music to change your life and what was the most recent? Hello, my name's Ray and I'm a teacher in a special needs school. And the thing that's most important to me in my life is my family and being happy. The first album to change my life was The Whole Story by Kate Bush. It was a combination of her wonderful storytelling and mesmerising voice that made me want to seek out her other albums, and I've been a fan of hers ever since. The most recent album to change my life is Brutalism by Idols. It's their passion, their lyrics, and the community that's built up around the band. I absolutely love going to Idols gigs. It's one of the friendliest audiences I've ever encountered. I think at every Idols gig I've been to, I've made a new friend. Hi, my name's Neil Larrisey. Uh, I'm a care worker and I honestly don't know what I'd consider most important to me in my life. I'd thought about the question, but the only thing I can think of is to live a good life, be happy and have the people I love be happy as well. The first album that changed my life uh, this year's model by Elvis Costello was, I think, the first of his albums that I flew to. From the moment it begins with the words, I don't want to kiss you, I don't want to touch, and then the guitar just goes off like a rocket to the moment it ends with Radio Radio blaring out about the death of the radio waves and prophetically many, many years before Spotify and Apple Music and all them. That was an album I was absolutely obsessed with and listened to all the time. Hi, I'm Lisa Marie. I'm a writer, journalist and blogger. I work by day for an international law firm as a journalist. And after hours, I'm a music journalist um, writing for publications, including Uncut Magazine, The Scots Magazine and The Arts Desk. This year, I have fallen in love with Nadine Shah, who obviously is, you know, a, a very critically acclaimed artist, you know, shortlisted for the Mercury Prize a couple of years back. But that's one that I got asked to review for one of the magazines I write for. And her new album is just so, I sort of about all the different, experiences of women in their 30s you know marriage kids ambition and it's just so clever and so joyous and so thought-provoking and I've had a, I had a really sort of visceral reaction to that um, another artist that I've discovered this year is Squirrel Flower um, and that's more sort of softer introspective music um it's funny you know I get sent these albums to review and then I go out and spend a fortune on records so um yeah it's 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 an expensive habit it's an expensive lifestyle um but you know I think particularly now more than ever with so much of the live industry in crisis you know music fans kind of we we kind of have to do our bit to show our appreciation to the artists that we love by buying their art, um, putting our money where our faith is. Thank you so much to Ray, Neil and Lisa Marie for contributing this week. I'd love to hear your musical story on a future episode and it really couldn't be easier to get involved. You have two options. You can head to speakpipe.com forward slash penfriend or you can record something on your phone or on your fancy recording device or whatever you like and email it to me, to laura at penfriend.rocks. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Now, back to my conversation with Corin. It's so interesting what you say about the service of it because I didn't really start thinking about songs in that way or songwriting in that way until maybe a year ago, which seems kind of like weird that it never came up <laughs> or never occurred to me. But just that idea of of writing a song as giving something. 
because mm-hmm. it wasn't like before that it was about my ego and I wanted people to come to my gigs to make me feel important. It wasn't like that at all. I just, it was quite probably quite the opposite, but I never really thought about it that way. Um, and that has massively changed the way I do everything as well. Just think, having that idea in my mind of this, this is something I'm giving. I'm not, it's not like I'm putting a song out and going, please love me. I'm just going, here's the thing. Cause I love you. It's like a different mode completely. It's, it's, it's very, yeah, it's been life changing thinking about it that way. Is that something you've had in mind for a while? The service thing? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, I think it's something that's, that I've thought about um, a lot in the past, like 10 or so years, even more than that. But again, like I started when I was young, so I didn't have that person. I could have a lot, definitely had like a lot of ego and a lot of like, well, we're going to be the best band. We're <laughs> going to be super cool. And that competitive thing. Yeah. And that's, that's okay too, because we wouldn't have survived without it. You know, we mm. would not have gotten anywhere. Um, without a feeling of like, we've got to be the best because we're going to make it, you know, like all of those kinds of like <laughs> sort of cheesy. That phrase is hilarious, isn't it? That making it thing. It's, oh God. Yeah. It's so universal though. Absolutely. But yeah. it's, I think it's, you know, that's part of it too, is feeling like, um, you know, when you're so young you and, you know, it was, it was a, a real struggle being you know, uh, like a female in the, you know, trying to be in the music business or, or whatever punk scene. Mm. I don't know. It just, it was, um, it was a struggle sometimes. And so that, that, you know, having that kind of sense of like competitive, like, um, pay attention to us cause we're really important, you know, mm. is, is I think it, it helped us get through some things, yeah. but I don't think that, um, as a long-term strategy is very helpful. Um, it's hard to maintain, isn't it? It's impossible to maintain because even if you're the flavor of the month when you're 25 or 24, like that lasts, uh, you know, maybe six months. And Mm. then you're like, now what? And, and what do I have to say? And what, what is this really about? Mm. You know, after that, that kind of moment passes. Um, what you know? What is this really about? And and what do I? What what purpose do I have here? Yeah. You know, and I think that I like finding that. I think is like crucial to getting through. Um, you know, the like mundane, the writing, the touring, just it's just everyday life. Yeah, you know, it's like, do I have? a stronger purpose, you know, that is unique to me and that is, is truly serving, you know, my community. Am I actually helping people Yeah, yeah, yeah. in any way, you know? Cause I think that's, that's a really human thing that, um, that will get you through and will, you know, provide like a stronger base, um, when there are so many like ups and downs yeah, to being sure. an artist. And I have to say, when I started releasing my own music about 10 years ago, it never would have occurred to me to think that my songs were going to help someone because that would have seemed like a massive ego thing for me to say, even to myself. But now it feels like it's absolutely the opposite thing. And it, it's, it's of course, that's what it's for. And that's what it should always have been for if it was, you know, if it, if it wasn't for anything else that that's just the absolute core of what art is. And I should have known that because I'm someone who loves art and gets so much from other people's art. But um, I think it's a journey, isn't it? So you you can't know everything all at once. And if you did, you probably wouldn't, you know, appreciate it or anything. So I don't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that um, that's kind of a lesson that you have to learn over and over as you're an artist, (laughs) you know? Um, it's easy to lose sight of and, and it's easy to get caught up in other things. And if that's, if there's one good thing about like pandemic and like 2020, it is kind of like this forced moment of looking at your life and being like, what, what, what is really important here? What is my purpose? You know? Yeah. And I definitely did that 
quite quite close to the beginning. I was, I was I was thinking, well, how am I spending my time? Why am I spending my time this way? Do I, you know, if I could do anything else in the world, would I still do this? And the answer was yes, I would, which was wonderful. But it doesn't make it easy. <laughs> it's still been no. really really hard. <laughs> and it's um, there's all this kind of you know looming existential: will there ever be gigs again? You know, how can anyone tour a record anymore? Things like that. Which yes in the grand scheme of the world are not important because people's health is most important people's families and everything else of course but of course it affects us because that's what our lives are so um I don't want to have a massive downer for you here but obviously you had a ton of touring (laughs) this year you were going to tour with one of my other favorite bands Wilco which I was delighted to see yeah how are you feeling about that if it's okay to ask I don't want to make it awful but yeah I mean it's you know, it's definitely sad and you definitely have like your selfish moments where you're like, but we're going to do Red Rocks with Will, you know, like, yeah. oh God. And, um, but, you know, I think that again, like you said, there's just, there's just more important things going on. There are people, you know, unfortunately dying from this pandemic and, yeah. and we just have to put, you know, of course people's health is more important and, we have to put that first and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to it. I know we will get back to it when the time is right. And when we yeah. have our, you know, our health safety vaccine, all of that is in, is in check. We'll get back to it because yeah. people love it and people miss it. And I know, I know we'll get back there. It just, yeah, it's going to take a while. Yeah. I feel like, um, I mean, I can still make music and do do quite a lot of things, and I feel very grateful for that. But I also feel really bad for people whose um, whose lives revolve around going to gigs all the time. Because I didn't know those people existed until I started doing my own music. Before that, I was playing in other people's bands, and I didn't really have anything to do with that sort of part of it. I think I didn't really, I didn't see who was coming each night and see if they were the same people and things like that. But now I know there are these communities of people who get so so much out of seeing their favorite artists on stage and having those communal moments I I just feel like I'm so sad that that has been taken away from them as well you know and again of course we don't need to put disclaimer on every part of this conversation of course it's more important that people do not congregate and that they wear masks and they are safe but there's definitely that 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 has a massive impact on people's emotional mental health and I'm trying to find ways to kind of counter that a little bit with what I'm doing but it's, it's really hard it's really hard for everyone. Yeah. I mean, I think I absolutely agree with you and just the loss of community, the loss of connection, you know, it's, it's super hard. Um, but you know, I think it's super cool that you're doing a podcast that, that we are trying like different ways of, of reaching out and connecting with people and, you know, providing it in, in different ways, um, is super important. And we'll, we'll just have to like, keep trying to do that yeah. until we can have shows again. Yeah, I think so. And so speaking of connection then, how's the internet impacted your career? So you've seen a lot of changes in communication. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Because like I was 18 when I started, we started playing in Heaven to Betsy and there was no, I mean, the internet was like being invented at that point, yeah. you know? <laughs> so um yeah, I mean it's it's hugely different now because mm. we have this other way of sharing music. Yeah. Um and listening to music. And I think that's just true of society in general. And if you take the larger view, you know, there was this time when records were invented and then there was this yeah. time when cassette players were invented and mixtapes and then, you know, in the nineties we had CDs, you know, like <laughs> that was like amazing. You know, I'm going to yeah. put this on a CD, you know? And, <laughs> and so if you take the long view of things, um, it's, it's another set of tools for humanity in terms of connection and, um, being able to listen to things. And I think it's a really, obviously a really powerful one. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, for a lot of, um, you know, more local musicians and independent musicians and smaller artists, it's harder to, for them to have a career mm-hmm. in a lot of ways because, um, 
you know, having your music streamed and shared isn't the same as like someone buying your record or, you know, it's just not the same. It's not the same kind of money that you would get, um, that, that we would get when we started selling records and selling, Mm. you know, actual product, um, of your music. It's like that actually puts food on the table, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I think that's, it's challenging in in a lot of ways for artists to, to figure out how to make a living. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's just kind of true of, of being artists in general, you know? Yeah. It's, it is a struggle to, to make a living. Um, but I think that, I think there are also a lot of, you know, benefits to, to having a global audience for your music. That's mm-hmm. incredible because that spreads ideas. And that is like, that's an incredible power of music is to, to really truly exchange perspectives mm-hmm. to have, you know, a band from, you know, Africa that is, you know, recording music about their experience in their village and um, uploading that to the internet and being able to listen to that and think about someone else's daily existence. I think that's super powerful. Um, And that it does give us the opportunity to step into someone else's shoes um, and really think about ourselves as a global community. I think that's, that's a really positive aspect of it. Absolutely. And in terms of like social media and smartphones and, um, and fans, have you had any positive experiences there? Is it something that you dip into and enjoy? Because some people don't have anything to do with that stuff. Um, oh, yeah. Bigger bands and some do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had so much fun with that on our European tour. Um, it was just, you know, we were just wanting people to know that we were on tour and we were like, doing all these shows and gigs Mm. in their towns. And we just went kind of crazy on social media. And we, (laughs) this is another thing when you're actually on tour and it's, you're sleep deprived and you're just silly. And like, we were like, what if we just, and we just started talking about the Eagles as a band (laughs) and like, and then we started like making videos for their songs on tour and posting them (laughs) on social media. as like, just, it was just silliness. And it was like, we're together all the time. We're backstage. We're trying to do this. And yeah, we just had fun with it. And I think it's powerful. It's powerful when people, you know, like pay attention to what you're doing. And then, you know, they are like, Oh, this is happening. I should go to the show and check this, this band out. So, yeah. So yeah, it's a tool. Yeah. And I love that it can show the silly side of, of Slater Kinney, for instance, which you might not know is there, but you are all multifaceted people. Slater Kinney's right. part of you. Your, you know, your performance on stage is part of the day. There's a lot of other bits of day that happen. And of right. course, it's up to, to all of us to decide where our boundaries are, what we want to share, what we don't want to share, how much we want to be picking up our phone all day and things, because there's obviously negative effects to that as well. With, if there's no boundaries but yeah just I, I I missed those videos I'm gutted but I saw all there's always amazing photos from your tour on Instagram I was watching every day and just being like oh they're the coolest women ever this is so good <laughs> <laughs> so I enjoyed it thoroughly yeah <laughs> I mean that's the thing that's like amazing is when you do have all this like amazing fan support and they're taking yeah. these like iconic photos and posting them in Instagram it's like yeah that's so fun because it is like a shared experience of the tour and you do know yeah. that people are enjoying it and, um, and getting something out of it, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's really, it's like an immediate way to see that. Yeah. That's lovely. I'm glad you're enjoying that. Yeah. It can obviously go wrong sometimes, but I think for the most yeah. part, people have a good <laughs> attitude towards it. Yeah. I think you, I think the idea of boundaries is super important <laughs> yeah. and just, In all you know, aspects of life, I feel. <laughs> in all aspects of life. <laughs> yeah. So how, and again, like asking about stuff right now is weird because it's an unusual time, but um, how do you balance family life and touring and various other bands? On paper, it seems like you're doing a lot of stuff and a lot of different Mm -hmm. projects and stuff. Yeah. How does that work? Um, I think it's, it's challenging. Um, I think that, 
Um, well, when my kids were super young, I, you know, there were times when I just didn't tour, you know, when there's times where you, where you just like, it's, it's, it would be like super challenging to make that happen. Yeah. Um, with my son, when he was little, I mean, he was like two, one and a half, two, when we put out another Slater Kinney record and, Mm -hmm. um, Pearl Jam asked us to open for them wow. in Canada and the U S and I was like, I don't, uh, I don't know how I'm going to do this, you know? And it was like, just take him with you. And I took my son along on most of that tour. I mean, he, mm. you know, he came along on Pearl Jam would like fly us on their plane after some of the shows. I mean, they're, so incredible, kind. incredible yeah. people. And, you know, both of my kids have been in the van when they were little, um, yeah. on the tour bus. Um, I have an incredible partner who's like a hundred percent, you know, has taken care of the kids and, um, you know, moms and dads, mother-in-law, mm. um, beautiful array of nannies and babysitters. I mean, all of it, it's yeah. I, like, it does like take a village. Yeah. And I think that's true of any career for a woman really. Yeah. Um, or, or you know, any parent, but kind of, especially, um, for women, it's, it's, there's a whole network of help that you need mm-hmm. to raise a child. And, um, you are going to need to ask for help and you should never feel ashamed of asking for help and saying, I don't know how to do this because, um, it is really hard Mm. and, you know, we're still like coming out of a very patriarchal society where, you know, it was set up for men to do the work and for women to stay at home. And we're Mm -hmm. still like undoing that. And, um, And so, you know, I think having just, like I said, like a network of different, um, options is, is really important. And sometimes it is really hard and sometimes it is kind of heartbreaking and you're away from your kids on tour and just angry and depressed and like, why Mm. am I doing this? You know, this is terrible. And so you have those moments and, um, you know, you get through them and then, you know, you have a lot of like super great accomplishments, you know, that I'm, I'm really fortunate. I think my kids are awesome and they, yeah. you know, they're older now and they are turning out great. And I'm kind of on the other side of maybe the most difficult, you know, aspects of parenting. Mm-hmm. I have a kid who's, you know, a sophomore in college now and I feel really grateful. I think I've had a really um, wonderful like journey of being a parent to these kids. And um, I'm happy that I was, I've been able to to continue to be creative during parenting. Yeah. Yeah. It seems really wrong to me that that would have to be a thing you'd have to put on a shelf for a really long time because of an assumption of what your role is, you Mm -hmm. know? So, and I know that it's, it's slow to change, but I'm glad that it's possible. And the, mm-hmm. all that has been possible for you. Yeah. yeah. Really glad. And you don't hate your kids. Yay. Uh, <laughs> you put a lot of time into that. It just seems really unfair if a kid turns out really bad and you're just like, oh God, I held yeah. you on my knee for so long. And this is what yeah. I get. Doesn't seem yeah. fair. No, I'm, I'm super lucky. They're like the best people. Gen <laughs> Z is like, you know, they're the future and they're yeah. like amazing, passionate, yeah. Like, let's do this. This whole world is obviously super messed up and we're going to change this. You know, that's what I think is really exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. We're very lucky to have them. Thanks for making some. I appreciate it. (laughs) (laughs) Some good ones. Well done. Yeah. What is success to you and do you feel you've ever achieved it? (sighs) What is success to me? I mean, I would say that success is connection. You know, like if I've ever connected with someone because of a song I've written or the way I've sung it or 
play guitar or any of that, that is success to me. Having a show where, you know, somebody feels strong emotion or cries or laughs or raises their fists in the air, you know, like <laughs> yeah. that's success to me. That's the true marker to me of, of making music that's important is, mm. are you, you know, are you impacting someone? Are you making a difference in their life and your life at the same time, you know, with mm. your music? Are you having that kind of human experience, that shared experience through music? That's the real success that you want to do with songwriting, you know? Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I think that you get there sometimes. Sometimes you don't, you know, with like different songs, different things that you try. Um, and that's okay. You know, it's like, keep trying to, to do something that's, that's, um, that impacts someone else, you know? Yeah. Lovely. Yes. Let's all do that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, which three of your own songs would you recommend to anyone who's new to the world of Corinne Tucker and her music? Oh boy. Jeez. (laughs) Um, Gosh, that is intense. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Well, um, check out The Center Won't Hold. I think that one is like, it's really interesting. And I think we did a lot of cool stuff um, sonically on that mm-hmm. record. Price Tag from No Cities is a song that um, I'm really proud of. I really think that like the whole way that that song is like put together and the lyrics and everything was, I felt like um, it was pretty powerful. And <laughs> I guess Axman from Heavens to Betsy, if you want to go way back yeah. and check out something um, from when I was like basically a teenager, that song is, is one that's, you know, kind of about coming out of high school and thinking about your experience there but it's a fun piece of songwriting and kind of catchy. <laughs> yeah, kind of catchy. It's yeah. very catchy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that really impresses me about you as a musician is that you've got always had this really distinctive vocal style. So when you listen to Heavens to Betsy and you listen to recent Slater Kinney, it's not identical. Obviously, you've grown up and it's 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 evolved and changed you know, to some extent. But I'm really interested to know how you managed to, one, get to that style if you had to get to it, if it wasn't just what com- you know, naturally came out of your mouth. And two, if there was any issues with like your confidence in just owning that and sounding unique. Because a lot of people, when they're singing, they emulate other people they like to start with and eventually kind of get to their own voice. But it seems to me like you just came fully formed as you, which is super cool. Um, I think actually <laughs> that I was emulating a a bunch of people at the beginning. Okay. But that maybe you didn't hear that because we didn't have the internet back then. Uh, and clever. yeah, cl- <laughs> very clever. Um, and so, you know, in, in those days we were playing shows all the time and trying different things. And the music was so loud, right. From punk rock, yeah. you could barely hear me. Yeah. So I would try all these different things. I would try and, you know, I definitely tried to sing like Kathleen Hanna mm-hmm. half the time. Sinead O'Connor, you know, uh, at some points, Aretha Franklin, I mean, I love soul. I loved her big voice. Um, so I did try and imitate people, but you couldn't hear me um, <laughs> because there was like the grunge guitar and the, and the drums. And so I did develop this like big voice mm. that competed with, with that sound yeah. and that, that, you know, and that just like drew people's attention. So it's um, a look at me kind of thing. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I've got a lot to say. You know, I was 18 years old and, yeah. you know, for me, I think my voice was about um, finding my power mm. and finding my way of articulating myself because I was very shy and awkward and, um, you know, had a hard time articulating myself in a lot of ways. Mm. And so finding the way of doing that through music and doing that through singing, it was like a release in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. I love, I love, I love hearing how people, yeah, the reasons, I think many of us have similar reasons for doing what we do and it's, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a nice way to feel like you're not alone. Absolutely. 
I wonder how surprising it was for people who knew you as this shy person to come and see you play. That must have been quite a different effect. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I think there's, you know, there's obviously this idea of like reinventing yourself Mm. as a musician, as an artist. And, you know, I was definitely wanted to be, you know, have a lot of like voice and gain respect and Mm. And, you know, and all of those things that I think that I didn't feel like I had when I was maybe like in high school and, yeah, you know, so, yeah. um, so yeah, I mean, I think that, I think there was a lot of surprise that happened from people that knew me yeah. in high school, you know, they're like, oh, uh-huh, you know, she screams as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Well, look, I'm going to respect your time and just ask you um, if you have any other artists that you're enjoying at the moment that you think people might like to listen to. Oh, yeah. There's so much good music that's come out. Um, I love um, that Waxahachie record, Mm. um, St. Cloud. That one is just one of my favorites this year. Um, That band from Texas, that's like the soul band. I think they're it's like Krung, Krungman. Is their name? It's hard to okay. pronounce. Oh, okay. They're really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So many good things. Chicano Batman. Um, that Britney Howard record's amazing. Uh, yeah. Lots of good stuff. Awesome. Well, look, thank you so much. I'll let you get on with your day, but it's been a dream to talk to you for this. So thank uh, you. Thanks so much, Laura. Thanks for having me. Yay. I've put together a deluxe blog post for this episode at penfriend.rocks forward slash Corin, C-O-R-I-N. Please come and visit and you can get links to all of the things that Corin mentioned, including her recent collaboration, which is beautiful. You can also grab those free songs from me at the same time. A few days after Corin and I spoke, I was struck by inspiration for a new song. And with her words in my head, I used all the tools I'd been practicing with over the years. I turned all my focus to that idea and it's turning into potentially one of the best songs on my new album. So special thanks for that. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. If you haven't subscribed to the series yet, please do. I have so much more to share with you. Your ratings and reviews make a massive difference to the visibility of this totally independent podcast on the various platforms, which not only means more people might listen, but helps potential future guests decide if this is something they want to be involved in. Thank you so much for supporting this series and supporting my music. It means the world. I'll be back next week with another conversation with another one of my favourite songwriters. See you then.